Great Happy numbers. To be here. Yes, we had great numbers. We were quite pleased. I think in some ways we did hit the ball out of the park. It was, you know, if you exclude the tax, uh, uh, deferred tax treatment in India, we had 18% growth in the bottom line on the back of 13% top line growth. I'll take that set of numbers any time. The question is whether that's sustainable going forward, given that Singapore is a key market for you and there are signs of a slowdown. Well, it's certainly not sustainable in the next year or so. And that's not uh, to do with Singapore. It is to do with the global interest rate environment. The Fed's made three cuts uh, July, August, October. And if you figure, uh, uh, figure another cut next year, uh, you know, 1% per, uh, point drop in Fed policy rate has a dramatic impact on net interest margin for the entire banking universe. So I think you'll see the same headwinds whether you're in the US or Europe or anywhere else uh, in the world. Look at the Singapore market. How optimistic are you the economy will pick up? In our conversation with Ravi Manon, uh, the managing director of uh, MES. Uh, MES, he did say that uh, the worst may be over in two to three quarters. Do you share that optimism? I think there will be some pickup. In fact, our base cases globally, you will see some pickup. IMF guided down to 3%, some indicators are less than that this year. Most people think a 0 0.2, 0 0.3 percentage point pickup next year. I think if they sign a China-US trade deal in the next couple of months, that would be helpful. Not just because of trade, but because of animal spirits and sentiments. But fundamentally, I think the world is going through a period of some degree of synchronized slowdown. So I don't think you'll see a massive uh, bounce back in economic activity next year. So that's one headwind. And like I said, rates are another headwind. So on the back of that, I think most of the blank banking sector uh, profitability next year uh, will be somewhat impacted. I don't expect to have a down year. We will still get growth. But I think it'll be hard for us to continue to deliver double-digit growth as we have in the last couple of years. In terms of sectors, which ones are getting hit? Which ones are looking pretty rosy? I think by and large, consumer and consumption spending is holding up most economies. It's true in the U.S. It's also true in some of the larger markets like you know Indonesia and China, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, Export-oriented sectors and the trading sectors are seeing a slowdown because global trade is indeed being impacted. But the biggest source of the slowdown is business confidence, and so capital formation and business investment is somewhat slow. Uh, if confidence comes back and people start putting money back to work, that will, of course, be uh, helpful. Beyond that is idios idiosyncratic. So if you're in Hong Kong, uh, quite clearly the inflow of Chinese tourists has stopped and therefore retail uh, sales are down, wealth management businesses are therefore impacted. So that, that's more sectoral and that's more country specific. Is Hong Kong and the protests hitting you and your numbers? It may not be now, but it could be two, three quarters down the road. Well, you know, on the one hand, the positive is I think Hong Kong is tremendously resilient. If you look at uh, the history of Hong Kong, it bounces down, but it's got tremendous capacity to bounce back up. Uh, and so you should never uh, count Hong Kong out. Uh, the other thing is that overall, the, the business in Hong Kong has been quite resilient for us. This quarter was fine. Um, I think there's some slowdown in trade, but our loan pipeline and our loan books for Hong Kong as we go forward are still quite uh, robust. I think if the Chinese tourists don't come, you will see slowdown in some sectors. Like I said, retail will be slow, uh, FNB will be slow. So you've got to be mindful of that. Uh, but uh, on the whole, I think also that as Hong Kong integrates more into the Greater Bay Area and they pursue this strategy of 9 plus 2, Hong Kong will evolve and play a meaningful role in different ways as well. Uh, Piyush, I want to talk about prospects for mergers and acquisitions. You've said before that uh, you know DBS will take a moderate approach, nothing more than 5% of your uh, market cap, but that's still a huge amount of money. What are possible plans, M&A plans for well, you? Well, I think our base case I should point out is that we're still focused on organic growth through digital means. Uh, we are, we're not changing our strategy at all. Uh, but within that, there are opportunities. And the example I've used often before is the acquisition we made of ANZ's business a couple of years ago. It allowed us to acquire a book of customer business on which we overlaid our digital strategy and we got very good uh, uh, accretion of uh, returns. So if we can find opportunities like that, uh, it's got to achieve three things. It's got to be strategically aligned to what we're trying to do. The economics must work. And we must have the management bandwidth to be able to squeeze the value out. Now, it's really the management bandwidth question. I don't want to do anything which distracts us from our digital game. So if it's a bite-sized deal that we think we can do without dislocating us, we'll look at it. So would Indonesia
Indonesia's Bank Permata be bite size? Is it still on the cards? Is it a possibility? Well, you know, we said we would take a look at that. We're also taking a look at several other opportunities in the region all the time. So still um, on the cards? Well, we don't necessarily comment on a specific case, but uh, we do look at opportunities uh, around the region. Uh, DPS has talked about remaining committed and wanting to ramp up uh, its presence in Southeast Asia. What are uh, some of the immediate plans? Well, we want to continue scaling up Vietnam, for example. As the supply chain is moving out of China, Vietnam is the number one beneficiary. Uh, we have a presence that's small. We've doubled down. We've grown rapidly in the last year. We think that's an opportunity to continue to uh, scale up and grow. Uh, we have a brokerage entity in Thailand, but that entity allows us to do a lot of banking, including wealth management business in Thailand. So that's an area that we continue to uh, look at. And as you said, Indonesia still continues to be an area of a lot of interest for us. Now, the Monetary Authority of Singapore is due to issue five digital banking licenses to non-bank players. How do you see that playing out and how are you, I guess, adapting to that environment? Well, you know, view, these are new uh, licenses, mean just new competition. So there are nine retail banks, uh, active retail banks in Singapore. It'll go from nine to 11. And so you figure we compete with nine, you have to compete with two more players. It is possible that they approach it with a different twist and a different way of approaching the market. Uh, but the truth is most of the Singapore banks have also embraced digital technologies. Uh, and so it's not entirely clear uh, how somebody can do something dramatically different. There'll be shades of difference. And in, in the wholesale bank space, there's some 200 wholesale banks, so there'll be 200 and some. Uh, so don't be wrong, I think competition is always something you need to look for and look at. But Singapore has already had a very competitive market. And if you have not been able to gird your loins and prepare uh, well in time, then obviously you get dislocated. If you've done a few things and if you're thoughtful, then you should be able to compete. Is it conceivable that there could be too many players? Because not too long ago, uh, the late Lee Kuan Yew said that even three banks in Singapore are too many. Well, that's true, but uh, you know the world is changing. And I think what you're finding is that the, the circumference for the range of competitors will change. Uh, you know, somebody said, all well, software is eating every industry. So the reality is the telco will compete in the space, the taxi company will compete in the space, and the complete tech company will compete in the space. So I do think you'll see a lot of different kinds of players offering different kinds of opportunities and uh, broaden the entire realm of uh, financial services distribution. What's the biggest challenge that DBS faces in the next 12 to 24 months? Well, cyclically, it is the challenge of declining interest rates. So that's obviously something that we have to uh, negotiate around. Uh, on the tech transformation, we just have to continue working harder to stay ahead of the game. Uh, we've been fortunate that we started early. We've been fortunate that we've been able to change the organization from a cultural standpoint. It's not easy for most legacy companies to uh, get their culture changed. But you can't sit back and be complacent. You have to continue running to uh, keep ahead.